Hi, my name is Dori Klesis and I'm with Mount Sinai. I'm with Kenneth Davis, the CEO and President of the Mount Sinai Health System. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Hi, Dori. You just did a panel, you moderated a panel on what will it take to prevent dementia? What did we learn? Well, we learned that there's little more cause for optimism than there's been in the past. And part of that is because we can now image changes in the brain 20 years before there are cognitive symptoms. That suddenly means that we can intervene very early. It changes the conceptualization of Alzheimer's disease. We can begin to think of it much more like cardiac disease in which things develop in the arteries around your heart very slowly over decades but we can see those and we can watch your cholesterol and we can lower your cholesterol and we can do something about those plaques of the heart and prevent a myocardial infarct. We are hoping to do the same thing in Alzheimer's, to develop drugs that we can give when people are not symptomatic, but that we can use to follow the progression of their amyloid deposits in the brain and slow up those deposits, if not reverse those deposits. So imagine if it takes 20 years to get symptomatic before you have Alzheimer's, and if the average age of getting Alzheimer's would be something like around age 80, and we develop a drug that can slow the progression by 50%, then you're not gonna get it till 100. That would be pretty good. There are lots of drugs now that we've learned that are in the pipeline that are being developed just for that target, to slow the development of these amyloid plaques over time. And what's really exciting to me is that they have a lot of different mechanisms of action. It's not all about we're just going to block the creation of amyloid. It's also we're going to work on an inflammatory system or we're going to work on the way microglia clear amyloid. So that I think all bodes well for the future. But you might ask me, what about the present. Mm -hmm. What can we do for people now? What can we do before we have this drug? Because these trials take a long time. The approvals take a long time. It could be, if we're lucky, five years. If we're unlucky, 10 or 15 before we have one of these drugs. And what we've learned is that there are lifestyle changes. And the panel talked a lot about them that can be used to decrease the likelihood that you would get Alzheimer's. Should everyone do those changes? Well, certainly it's a good thing because the changes that we're talking about are the kind of changes that you would do for good cardiac health too. So they're really having a sustained and meaningful exercise program. It's making sure that you watch your glucose, you watch your hemoglobin A1C, which means for those people whose fasting glucose starts to approach 100, something that we call metabolic syndrome, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes, that we do everything in our power to decrease the likelihood that you will move from metabolic syndrome to type 2 diabetes, or even from a normal glucose metabolism to metabolic syndrome. And the way we can do that is by watching our diet and exercising. And in terms of the breakthrough drugs, we haven't had one since your early work in the field. Um, is, is it just, you know, those 35 drugs, is it a failure or have we learned from them? I think we've learned from them, but I think scientists need a little more humility. And that humility would say, perhaps we were taking the wrong approach. Perhaps we have overinvested in the notion that amyloid and decreasing its production or getting an antibody that strikes right at the amyloid and clears it is actually going to be beneficial. We've had drugs that we've tested that completely cleared amyloid from the brain with no change in cognition. Um, there are some in our field who were so wedded to this hypothesis that they'd like to believe we simply didn't do it at the right time. I take a little more agnostic view, which is I think we have to look at many other opportunities, many other therapeutic targets, um, keep all our options open for what we have to do to decrease the likelihood that this will become Alzheimer's disease. And those therapeutic targets, is it the amyloid? Is it inflation? Are there other targets? Well, 
in inflammation, there are a lot of targets. Um, there are things like the microglia, microglia clear amyloid. What we know is that people who get Alzheimer's disease, their microglia clear amyloid much more poorly than microglia in people who are not getting Alzheimer's disease. So what can we do to make those microglia better? How do we make them function more efficiently? Um, we can also ask, are there inflammatory markers that create an amyloid cascade? Can we intervene so that that doesn't happen? Um, but we also have to remember, this wasn't discussed in the panel, that there are people who we autopsy at the end of life who have lots of amyloid plaques, lots of neurofibrillary tangles, and are cognitively completely normal. We have to ask, how did that happen? So it is not inevitable that plaques and tangles lead to cognitive decline. Uh, now, maybe those brains have other things that cause the synapses to grow and connect. So that one of the approaches that was discussed at the panel was what can we do to enhance connectiveness? What drugs might we get to enhance, to enhance synaptic genesis? And how important is precision medicine in, in this field? Well, we think precision medicine is gonna be important in all of medicine. Um, will precision medicine help us with Alzheimer's disease? That's controversial. One member of our panel would have said, absolutely not. Another member of our panel says, absolutely yes. Um, what I believe is the following. I think that there are lots of ways to get to what we call the phenotype of Alzheimer's, which is plaques and tangles. And if there are many ways to get there, there may be many different genes that could cause it and many different pathophysiological pathways. If that's the case, what precision medicine will do is tell us what path a particular patient is on and what intervention might be best for that patient. But that's way in the future. And final thoughts, um, what did the panel leave uh, for the audience? What's the future like? Can we just focus on prevention? I think what the panel left was the feeling that the future will be a lot better than the past for what has been Alzheimer's research. And that's made all the more probable by the fourfold increase in the NIH budget for Alzheimer's disease research. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you.